I'm Dean. I'm the dad. I'm Laura. I'm the mom. And I'm Crystal, and I'm the daughter. And together we are Family, Family Plot. Plot. That worked. Mm, excuse me. Well, welcome to another awesome edition of the Family Plot Podcast. Uh, we have a lot in store for you today. Uh, Speaking of stores, sooner or later, we'll get our merch site back up, so just hold on there. Uh, while we're talking about stuff, though, you can do to help us, uh, let's stop. start with our Patreon. Uh, you, can, you can always help us by doing a monthly donation on Patreon. There are uh, three groups you can join for our Patreon. Uh, Team Podcast. Team Bunny. And Team Electric Bill. Doesn't really matter, though, because it all goes the same place to feed the chubby bunny and pay the electric bill. And all yeah. of the electric bill. Uh, and I and don't get me wrong, Krista, I love our chubby bunny, but she's the only bunny I've ever seen with triple chins. Anyway, uh, also, uh, if you can't do a monthly donation, uh, we you can do just a one-time donation through Buy Me a Coffee. Uh, we that that would be fine. Also, uh, if you can't do a donation, you can still help us out. Uh, if you enjoy the show, share it on social media. If not, please keep it to yourself. Yay! That was so nice. That worked out so well. Much like if you can't say anything nice, keep it to yourself. She's right. learning so well. Yeah, well, Thumper is a good teacher. Thumper is the Jesus of the Disney animals. No, he's just a Okay, again, it was his father, and... No, he's not. Go on. Okay, so what are we talking about tonight? Well, tonight, we set our borrowed Wayback Machine to the 1930s, where we look into the famous disappearance of Judge Joseph Force Should Crater. Should I tell him it's not a Wayback Machine, it's just a cardboard box that he's painted? Don't, don't break his dreams like that, man. I know, You're right. it's so hard You're to right. see. Wow, this Wayback Machine's so incredible, honey. Uh, isn't that a great name, though? Joseph Force Crater? Makes me wish we'd named Krista... Crystalline Thunder Williams, or, you know, Crystalline Awesome Williams. Something like that. Dad, Dad, if you would name, if you gave me those, if either of you gave me any of those middle names, I would probably despise my middle name and change it yeah. as soon as I turn 18. I'm just saying, Joseph Force Crater, he became quite the guy, so... Maybe having a strong middle name like that would help you. Okay, but hear me out. If your middle name was Epic, and when you got older, you married someone with the last initial of G, your initials would spell out Keg. <laughs> to me, but I liked it. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, now, with uh, Judge Joseph Force Crater, we dig into his history a bit. Uh, we do a brief look at the New York of his day, because any one of these topics I'm talking about could take a whole podcast. Um, we also look into the events leading to his disappearance with a few theories as to how, why, or who was involved in his disappearance in this historical true crime episode of the Family Plot Podcast. But first, but first our Krista has a corner. Welcome back to my corner. I am Crystal, and as you all know, if you were if you have been here before, hi, hello, welcome back. You know my crazy self. If you're new, oh boy, uh, welcome. welcome, welcome to the chaotic family plot family. Uh, it is chaotic here. We are a bit crazy. You'll fit in just fine. Just fine. Absolutely. Anyways, uh, if you have not heard the last episode. 
Which, why haven't you? Yeah, what's wrong with you? Stop what you're doing right now. Go, go and back. Listen to the last episode go and then back. come back. <laughs> and come back. If you have that time, if not, it's fine. I totally get it. I know I'm being passive aggressive. You don't have to listen to a 14 year old. Um, but should. It's it's slightly important for what I'm going to talk about today, seeing as I'm going to talk about the same thing I was talking about last week. It's basically going to be a part two. I'm not going to say the name. It triggers father for some reason. I know the reason. We're not going to say it on this podcast. Um... Go on, keep talking, keep talking. We'll, we'll fill him in later. He's forgotten already. Yeah. So, I have gotten further into the series. Yay! Oh, yeah, it's the so miraculous. Oh, yeah, the miraculous ladybug thing. Yes, go on. Yeah. Um, so, a lot has happened. I am already on the fifth season. It's out on Disney Plus. You all should watch it if you're into that kind of thing. Um. So all the Kwamis got stolen. Yeah. And now the love triangle has finally switched. Mm-hmm. As uh. Now. Cat Noir. Mm-hmm has a crush on Marinette, and Marinette now has a crush on Cat Noir. Uh-huh. But Marinette no longer has a crush on Adrian. Adrian. Mm. And you know. And now Adrian no, has a cr- no longer has a crush on Ladybug. So, well, there you go. So, you know, when a, when a romance triangle looks like that, and goes the other direction, it can kind of be considered now a romance star instead of a triangle. That's smart. Yeah. <laughs> or since the star of David is actually like kind of two triangles, it's like a, a, a romance star of David. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of star that I was talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that happened. All the... All the miraculous are have been stolen by Hawk Moth. And now he is Monarch. I see. Which is super fun. He's upgraded from a moth to a butterfly. Yeah. And now he's giving other people the powers of the Kwamis. So that's super fun. Okay. He's literally committing Kwame abuse. Oh. Yes, very sad. But, uh, all that went down. So, that was fun to watch. It's also fun to watch painstakingly obvious relationship goal type stuff to go on, and neither of them be in a relationship yet. That's super fun. I will take your word for it. <laughs> My sarcasm is probably not that easy to tell. I mean, it's sarcastic. I, think. I, I assumed as much. But I just think it's stupid if you both realize that you like each other. Just start dating, god darn it. But if they did that, it, it wouldn't be quite as dramatic a series. Because then, it, it's once they're in a relationship, it's sort of harder to manipulate without ending it or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it's that it's not there yet. It, 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 it gives the fans something to yearn for. They do that in a lot of shows. Like uh, with The Walking Dead, it was Carol and Daryl. Everybody thinks Carol and Daryl should be together. And uh, it, they never gotten together, although I guess they're together in this European spinoff of The Walking Dead that's getting ready to start. Apparently, they both go to Europe, but uh, I, I and I don't even know if they're in a relationship or just traveling together. But a lot of people were shipping Carol and Daryl. Now, it, 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 so it sounds like it's the same thing. It's it's this relationship that uh, the fans, as much as anything else, want to see, and they're going to play with it to keep up fan interest. Right, but like this whole love interest thing has been going on since day one. 
Like, Marinette has been just fawning over Adrian, and it's just like... Well, she is French, so... I know, but this... Ah, just can't. I can't see it. Look, you're talking about a culture that eats rabbits and pigeon hearts, so the French are weird. I mean... I'm positive on the French. I learned French in high school. They have a heck of a culture. Heck, we covered the catacombs, our second episode. So I I do not hate the French, but to quote Eddie Izzard, they can be a bit French. Wow, really? Never heard of this one. But yeah, all that has gone down. If you want any more, like, information... There are probably tons of people on YouTube talking about the storyline and just the characters themselves and what happens in the show. If you don't want to watch the whole show, I get it. It's like 48, maybe even like 64 hours worth of show. So, yeah, that's part of it. If you don't want to sit down and watch the whole thing, don't have to just go on YouTube find a look over. Do whatever you please with that information. Mm -hmm. Um, If you do want to sit down and watch the show, do so. Do whatever. Um, But yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about it, because I'm not going to break down the whole thing. I've broken down a lot of it, (laughs) I feel like. So if this was enough information for you, good. Congratulations. If not, go go to YouTube, go to Google, find out what's going on in the series. We'll be caught up just fine. <laughs> or Hulu. Mm-hmm. Which, with, or not Hulu, but uh, Disney Plus, which when yeah. combined with Hulu, isn't really that expensive. No. Nope. Not at all. So. Yeah, um, the series is on Disney Plus. It's on Disney Plus, and the movie is coming out on Friday, the day after we record, so it's going to be out on Netflix here in America. Mm, there's a new movie coming out. Cool. That's what I just said. I was excited. Okay. <laughs> okay, now before we get into this week's the meat of this week's episode, Ed, there was something I wanted to discuss with you both, and it's not on our schedule, like a- but I just had this idea, actually, earlier today. Uh-huh. That maybe, I've been thinking for a long time about our Patreon, and maybe doing Patreon episodes, but I didn't want to create episodes that anybody had to work on, meaning uh, that we shouldn't have to come at it with notes like we do with a regular show, and, and, and it occurred to me today what we could do for our Patreon episodes is we could do guests and just talk about things like the Wayback Machine and where I where it comes from and and stuff about our family and every episode we could have a different guest and it could be like podcasting friends like the people from Drunk Theory or that would be fun or or Amelia from uh, Bitchin Boutique or mm-hmm. you know or it could be like. We could drag in Lexi one week. We could drag in Blue one week. We could drag in Demix one week. He'd be willing to talk to us at all. Absolutely. You know, and just do these like our friend Jennifer could come. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or you know, we could Grandma. Grandma Grandma. would be really cool. Yeah, and of course, like other other people who guest on our show, Danny, Sheila, uh, Dale, you know. Uh, but we could also have people that we wouldn't normally have on as well. Uh, just, you know, and, 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 and because it's, it's Patreon, so it would be only listenable by our members, by our right. members, Absolutely. we could, we could be a little more than PG-13. So if Chris, Christopher got it herself and dropped another F-bomb, I wouldn't have to bleep it out. Yeah, you wouldn't have to spend all that time finding a bleep. Well, y'all could just listen to us talk. <laughs> well, it, but it, it anyway. Then all we have to do is just record whenever it it suits our mood. 
to do these Patreon episodes. Yeah, absolutely, I like it. Right. And for different different sections, um, should we do like different topics for doing the arts? Uh, I wasn't even or... thinking we'd necessarily do topics. We'd just talk about whatever. Yeah, uh, it, like shoot shoot the poo. Right, right. So. Well, I can't say that the way I would normally say it. It's not PG-13. Exactly. See, and on our Patreon, she, she is could... 14 now, though. We need to think about that. I, I I am. But, yeah, I was just saying, we could do these... Yeah, and we just talk about whatever. Whatever yeah. pops into our heads. We'd yeah. love, you know, we'd cover our... Like, gig. like Krista's ta- been talking about her anime. We could talk about lots of animes... Or if we, we had could dynamics, about, we could uh, talk about art and different art styles and different arts you like and different art styles and animes and whatever, whatever. Sorry, I'm going out. It, it, you talked see, anime, now anime's in my head. See, here's my thing. Um, this this sounds like a good idea. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Um, my, I was gonna say like maybe I could do the. Podcast thing I was talking about, like talk about more stuff, like my time being the party thing, you know. Yeah, Krista, we could talk about anything you wanted. It would be a different vibe, basically. It would be the people who would be in our Patreon. They'd be part of the family. And so they, it would basically it would be our little version of Family Matters. What's going on in the family this week? And you know, like I said, we'd have guests, extended members of the family on, and yeah. So that was my thought. Um, and and they'd be we wouldn't have to to like do show notes or anything. We just start talking. Right, right. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a nice way to. So, yeah, then uh, yeah, start looking for Patreon episodes, because that's what we'll do. All right, so now that we've covered that, let's get into the show that we've planned. Um, Sounds good. Okay, I'm going to talk about Judge Crater grow- growing up. Uh, obviously, he didn't start out a judge. That's not the way it works. Um, although you apparently can name a child judge. Because, well, Judge Reinhold. Yep. Um, so, Joseph Force Crater, and had, did I mention how much I love this name? Joseph Force Crater was born on January 5th, 1889, in Easton, Pennsylvania. Uh, Crater was one of four, four children born to his father, Frank E. Crater, an orchard owner and operator of a produce market. His mother's name is Layla, I believe, L-E-I-L-A. I think that would be Layla. Maybe Leela, I'm not sure. Uh, Vir- but Layla Virginia Montague. Uh, Crater began to show a passion for music during his youth and was encouraged by his mother to play the piano. Even though his family never struggled financially, Crater still put in long hours working for his father at a young age and learned what it was like to work hard. After attending high school, Crater stayed in Easton and enrolled in Lafayette College. He graduated in in 1911 from Lafayette with honors. Uh, Afterwards, Crater went on to Columbia University to pursue a law degree and graduated from Columbia in 1916. During his time at Columbia, Crater met a married woman named Stella Wheeler. Crater and Wheeler began spending a lot of time together, and he helped her get her divorce. Seven days later, they were married. Oh, that must have been a lot of money. Well, I mean, he was an attorney, so she didn't have to pay for the divorce. Got his start as a law clerk, and in order to supplement his meager income, Uh, He began teaching law classes, first at the City College of New York, then later at Fordham University, and later still at New York University. I want to say all these colleges still exist today. Uh, He continued to teach these courses passionately for the rest of his career. 
uh, tiring of the long hours and low pay, he got into politics, and his first political appointment uh, was serving as secretary to the New York Supreme Court Justice Robert F. Wagner Sr. in 1920. Now, Robert F. Wagner Sr. actually goes on to become a senator uh, for New York, but uh, at this point he was still uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, for New York. And uh, one thing uh, around this time is when people began to notice just how smart Judge Crater was. They had people talk about how he had a brilliant legal mind. Um, Joseph opened his own firm in 1927 and was almost an overnight success. Joseph and his wife hired servants and began to entertain lavishly. Joseph was so successful, he would be unaffected by the stock market crash of 1929. In 1930, he was then uh, appointed by then Governor of New York, Franklin D. Roosevelt, to the New York Supreme Court. Now, uh, you might think the New York Supreme Court is the highest court in New York. It's actually the second highest, the highest being New York Court of Appeals, but still pretty nice at 41, which is around the age he is at this point, for him to land this sweetheart gig. Right. Absolutely. Uh, And and he was really just to temporarily temporarily fill the seat of a jurist who had just retired, uh, because uh, Roosevelt was on his way out. He was going to be president soon. Right. So this was sort of a last-minute deal. And he probably would have gotten the seat full time, but yeah. Uh, But this really sets the stage for the disappearance of a man referred to later as the missingest man in America. Wow, that's some really impressive use of the English language there. That's not even a word. The missingest man in America. Wow, well, how about let's check our grammar? The most missing man in America. Well, sure. Okay. Um so in New York in nineteen thirty, much of New York was still reeling from the great stock stock market crash, which had vastly increased the number of poor and homeless in the city. Still, New York was a glittering, gleaming jewel of a city, and its now iconic skyline was coming into view. When I wrote that, what I meant was, what we think of today as the New York skyline Mm -hmm. was really just, like, you could look at it in picture then, and it would look very similar today. Gotcha. Uh, it, because both the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building were built in, in late 1920s, early 1930s. In fact, the Empire State Building uh, was called the Empty State Building for a long time because by the time it was finished, the crash happened, and they couldn't afford, uh, like most of the people who they wanted to be tenants couldn't afford to be tenants. Right, right, absolutely. Coming into view. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You're absolutely fine. Broadway was still quite popular, and many who could afford it would visit the Great White Way to see a show. Crater was a huge fan of Broadway, and he had a ticket waiting for him at the Belesco Theater to see the show Dancing Partners, a ticket he would never claim. There were so there were many homeless people living in rows and rows of shacks in city parks. These were known as Hoovervilles, named after Herbert Hoover, who was president during the stock market crash, and many blamed him for the crash. So. Next is my part, because Dad's cool and he gave me a part. Well, uh, to be fair, one of our listeners, I want to say from the Ukraine, in fact, sent us an email about how 
he was disappointed that Krista only did her part and then really sort of vanished for the rest of the podcast. And so we talked about it as a family, and this is one of the things we can talk about on a Patreon episode. Mm -hmm. But Krista was like, well, I should, you know, if people want to hear me do more, then we, I should get some parts too. So that's what we're doing. Because oh, I'll say this: like this should be a Patreon episode. So you're getting it now. More explanations of this will be in any Patreon episode if you want to um, do that, or if you decide that you want to do that. Um. I honestly didn't feel like I had anything to say because, yes, while sometimes I can talk and I do know what to say, a lot of the times I really, it's hard for me to focus on what's going on and I don't really feel comfortable talking because I feel like I'm going to, like, interrupt someone and I don't want to do that. So I'm just like, okay, I'll just be quiet, I guess, because I don't really want to interrupt so, yeah, that's basically it. Krista. Um, you can always interrupt me. I'm good. I'm good. This is just not part of my... Anyways, I, I, will, I will read my notes now. No discussion of the disappearance of Judge Crater would be complete without a brief discussion of Tammany Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall was a famously corrupt machine of the New York Democratic Party, which would offer charity diners and other boons in exchange for votes. I think I remember this in history class. Yep. In the 1920s, it was trying to clean up its image, but not its actions. So, it didn't work out really well, did it? Mm -mm. In 1930, Judge Crater had appeared as part of the Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall, July 4th celebration. 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Celebration reading a poem. Crater had also been president of one of Tammany Hall's clubs and served on its legal committee. So we can say for sure he was no stranger to corruption and was in good standing with Tammany Hall at the time of his disappearance. Okay. So let's talk a little bit uh, about Judge Crater's character. Because all of this is going to be important. Uh, Before we dig into his disappearance, uh, we must discuss some of the less savory aspects of his character. For one, we know he was a drinker, and in fact, he and his wife Stella would drive to Canada, a popular vacation destination for Americans during Prohibition, who would drive north to drink legally. Uh, We also know he hung out with men like Arnold Rothstein, a known gangster and a man that Crater considered to be a good friend. In fact, when Rothstein was murdered, uh, Crater was quite upset by it. We also know that Crater was quite the philanderer, and a philanderer is someone who cheats. Um, I know, Krista. I know. Uh... He maintained at least three mistresses, all of them showgirls, Sally Lou Ritz, June Bryce, and Vivian Gordon, in addition to having several relationships with chorus chorus girls and dancers. So, and, and, and this was a lifelong problem for him, because after he disappeared, you know when people, like, go missing or they die or something, they tend to interview people who... A lot of people, like the college and the high school where he grew up, talked about how promiscuous he was. With every woman that you cheat on, another bone I'll break in your body. How about that? She's got some guns on her, Daddy. Yeah, I know. (laughs) She's got your muscles. (laughs) 
In late July of 1930, Judge Crater and his wife Stella were staying at their summer cottage in the Belgrade Lakes of Maine when Crater got a phone call that seemingly disturbed him. He would tell his wife nothing about the call other than that he needed to get to New York to straighten those fellows out. He took a train to Atlantic City and picked up his mistress, Sally Ritz. He spent a couple of days in Atlantic City before returning to Belgrade Lakes to see his wife on August 1st. He left again on August 3rd, going to New York, promising to return by his wife's birthday on August 9th. On the morning of August 6th, Judge Crater woke in his New York apartment, went to his office, and began shredding documents. He had his law clerk, Joseph Mara, cash checks totaling $5,150, roughly $90,000 in today's money. Mara then helped pack two suitcases with documents and other things and helped Judge Crater transform, transport them to his apartment. Crater, Crater then gave Mara the rest of the day off. Later, Crater went to Billy Hoss Chop House, a restaurant on 45th Street in New York with his girlfriend, Sally Ritz, and fellow lawyer and friend, William Klein. After dinner, both Klein and Ritz initially said that they saw him get into a cab that headed west on 45th Street. So later, they amended their testimony to say that he got into a taxi that Crater had left you, on... They, not he. Oh, gotcha. Amended their testimony to say that they got into a taxi, but Crater had left on foot walking east down the street. But this was the last time Crater would ever, ever be seen. And now that Judge Crater has gone missing, let's take a moment for a word from our sponsors. Wow, it took them a while tonight. Who? Oh, but uh, that's I good. I also feel sponsored. However, before we move on to my part, which I will start talking again, I'm just going to let a little steam off before I go and punch someone in the face. Um, my guess, my guess in this point in time is that the girlfriend or somebody found a note or something that he was writing instead of a document read it, and then told the girlfriend. <laughs> and then the girlfriend found out, and she made a plan to kill him. My Krista is so anti-philandering. <laughs> <laughs> of course I am! <sighs> Sorry, sir. Sorry, I will respect the dead. I will. Once the dead respects the people that they lived with before. Okay. Okay. Next. I'm gonna cool off and read this part. Even though Crater had disappeared, thankfully, his disappearance in initially went unnoticed. When Joe did not deter return to Belgrade Lakes in time for his wife's birthday, Stella was upset. When he was still missing a few days later, she made a, f a few phone calls to friends in New York trying to track him down. Still, there was no outcry. On August 25th, when the New York Supreme Court... Convened. Yeah, convened. I was trying to make sure. Convened, and Judge Crater had still not shown up. They began a quiet investigation, which, which became public 
by September 3rd. September 3rd was front page news. So let's talk a little bit about the investigation. Uh, from almost the moment Judge Carter's disappearance was made public, the investigators began to become inundated by tips from the public claiming that the judge was seen in numerous places. Places as far away as L.A., uh, as basically almost every state in the court country, someone reported it citing Judge Crater. Wow. So... That quickly began to befoul the investigation. Uh, now, the detectives uh, found that Judge Crater's safety deposit box had been completely emptied, and that the two briefcases and these these cases are alternately described in in various sources as suitcases or briefcases. So I have to imagine small suitcases, but I don't know for sure. Um, but the two briefcases described by uh, Joseph Mara had completely disappeared. But these tips led nowhere. Also, Judge Crater's philandering ways were becoming known. Uh, investigators began attempting to interview these women. Uh, Sally disappeared in late August or early September of 1930 and was later found living in Youngstown, Ohio, with her parents. Mm. She was still being investigated as late as 1937, by which point she was living in Beverly Hills, California. Wow! Now, June Bryce, who had been seen speaking to the judge on August 5th, was suspected of attempting to blackmail the judge. Mm. Uh, on the day the grand jury was convened, June disappeared and was not discovered again until 1948, where she was found in a mental hospital. Vivian Gordon was a high-end prostitute who was linked to the famous, at that time, Madam Polly Adler. Uh, she was also linked to organized crime figure Legs Diamond. Uh, on February 30th, 1931, Vivian was quite upset about a court verdict that had cost her the custody of her 16-year-old daughter. In the wake of Crater's disappearance, an investigation had been launched into the government corruption in the city, and Vivian Gordon met with the head of said investigation. She offered to testify to what she knew about both corruption in the city government as well as the city police force. She was killed five days later, and the publicity over her death led to the firing of the police officers she accused of framing her and the suicide of her daughter. And again, uh, trigger warning here, suicide is not something to be taken lightly. It's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Uh, do not commit suicide. Call 988, which is the national uh, suicide hotline number. Uh, and as uh, Kate from Ignorance Was Bliss says, you matter. So, uh, you do matter. People will miss you. Make sure yes. to try and take care of yourself. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. Depressive times can be like really a big issue to go through. But you can hang on. You've done it your whole life. And it's not always easy to take care of you. People can't always be around for you. But you still, you matter so much. Do not forget that you are a person. You deserve all the love you can. The scandal also led to the uh, resignation of New York's mayor, uh, Jimmy Walker, who did not say, Dynamite! So really I'll try it later. I'm good. Uh, actually, Jimmy Walker was one of the most powerful figures in Tammany Hall at that time, and yet they still hired him for good times. Isn't that cool? Uh, in October, a grand jury was paneled to investigate the case. It interviewed 95 witnesses and generated almost 1,000 pages of testimony. Stella Crater declined to appear, and eventually 
the grand jury announced that there was not enough evidence to determine the cause of his disappearance, nor whether Crater was dead or alive. Six months after his disappearance, Sal Crater announced that she had found stocks, bonds, cash notes, and other things in a desk that the police had searched weeks earlier and found empty. Furthermore, Stella had several items that folks knew had been in Crater's office a few weeks later, but no one was quite sure how she acquired them. Years later, Stella would publish the book, The Empty Robe, and she gave her theory that her husband had been murdered for reason or reasons unknown. She had him declared legally dead in 1939, which sounds bad, that last part, but... At the time, she was living on $12 a week as a telephone operator, which would be impossible today, but back then it, it was a survivable rate, wage, but just barely. Right. And so by having her husband declared dead, she got his life insurance. She, got, she was able to survive. Right. And so, yeah, so having him declared dead was probably not proof of anything, any wrongdoing on her part. Right. Uh, let's take a moment for another word from our sponsors, just because I feel like this week, like last week, we may venture into longer episode territory. Um, feel sponsored. Cool. <laughs> Lexi, do you feel sponsored over there? Yeah. Okay, awesome. I also feel sponsored, by the way. I feel left out. I feel left oh. out. Well, he was worried about Lexi feeling left out, and our little Lexi's feeling very good tonight, so that yeah. was trying to give, him, give her a little bit of... Do you feel sponsored yeah. too, Krista? I do feel Do you feel less left out now? I do feel less left out. All righty. I appreciate it. I'm just being... Uh, I'm going to turn theories over to That's you. That's right. That's my part. And I apologize. <laughs> so, let's talk about some of the theories. One theory is that Judge Crater was killed by mob boss Lucky Luciano. Crater had overseen a case involving Luciano and while Luciano was not convicted, many feel that Crater had been compromised in some way, leading to the acquittal and providing the reason he was later murdered. Another theory is that he is the victim of a political hit. This theory goes that due to his connection to Tamari Hall, Tamani Hall, or the police force, oh, and other unsavory figures, he had compromising information on some political figure or the police force. Thus, he was killed to make the information go away. A third theory is he just disappeared. He just disappeared. Yep, just, poof, he was gone. That he took the money and suitcases and started a new life somewhere else. However, beyond the suitcases and the cash, there is no evidence to back this theory up. Another theory is that he simply that he was simply killed in some street crime or accidentally, possibly while intoxicated. Without a body, it is impossible to prove or disprove this theory. Finally, in 2005, authorities revealed that Stella Perushi Good, who had died at the age of 91, left a letter in which she claimed that her former husband, NYPD, Officer Robert Good had learned that Crater was killed by corrupt NYPD officer Charles Burns and his brother Frank. He was killed by Frank Burns? Different Frank Burns? Sure. 
Well, I, I don't know. Are linked to? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it, may, maybe Frank Burns got together with J.J. Walker. Maybe. This is, this is wild. <laughs> I was thinking the J.J. Walker thing was just in your head, but that's a really weird coincidence. <laughs> Anyway, where was I? Oh, both men <laughs> were linked to the organized crime group dubbed Murder, Murder Incorporated. Wow. According to the letter, Crater was buried near West 8th Street in Coney Island, Brooklyn, at the current site of the New York Aquarium. However, when the area was cleared to build the aquarium in the 1950s, no one reported any skeletal remains. Many are skeptical of Farushi Goods' account for this reason. So let's talk about the legacy of, uh, uh, of Joseph Crater becoming uh, the missingest man in America. Uh, Crater is remembered for his brilliant legal mind, but even more so for his disappearance. Indirectly, his disappearance led to the end of the reign of Tammany Hall, as well as a purging of the city's political leaders, leading to less corruption in New York politics, at least until 2016 when Trump ran for president. Hey, well, we're not getting political. Multiple TV shows have referenced the judge's disappearance, including MASH, right? Uh, Star Trek Enterprise, Rod Serling's Night Gallery, and History's Greatest Mysteries, just to name a few. The phrase pulling a judge crater is still used today, almost 100 years after crater's disappearance, meaning a surprising or unexpected disappearance. Comedians of the era even gained a catchphrase in the stock line, Judge Crater, please call your office. Wonderful. So, that is what happened. And, and, and to our listeners, I will apologize. We're not going to solve the mystery. I don't, we don't have any information that is not publicly available we're not going to solve this mystery. But... I will that say, being uh, said... I will say this right now. Um, we're not in the past. This is in the past. We, we can't change whatever is going on. We can't change what happened. We're not time, actual time travelers as much as we'd like to be. <laughs> as much as I would like for sure and Penny not to be born... I can't go back in the past and make sure that it doesn't happen. That would not be good. I'm just saying. <laughs> nice, Lexi. I'm glad you're getting all comfy. So. Wow. I mean, there's like. I mean, I think it's kind of stinky that they're talking. Well, I mean. Who didn't want to kill this guy? His wife, presumably, but even that... Even her were like, huh, maybe. Are you, are you sure? Are you sure that she wasn't just freaking thrilled that he finally didn't come home one time? How many times do you want... I mean, he's admittedly a philanderer. I yeah. would assume at some point you would be like, yeah, the theory is she found out about she found out this dude was a philanderer. She wanted him killed. She got a girl to kill him. He's dead. She's happy. Yeah. Well, okay. But for the rest of her life, when people would talk to her about his philandering, she would be she would be of the, she would sort of put out the idea that. If all you're talking about is the fact that he had lots of girlfriends, you're missing the point. You're missing that he was this brilliant legal guy. 
So she always defended him, even after he disappeared. Now, I do have questions about how she wound up with some of the things she ended up with, but considering that his disappearance went for a month without anybody really noticing or caring, it's it's quite possible in my brain that she called William Klein or one of his other friends, hey, can you swing by Joe's office and pick these things up for me? It wouldn't have been that big a deal. And, you know, I don't know if they ever investigated that theory. So uh, sure. I, I feel like yeah. even with her, we sort of have to assume it's, that it's kind of mundane. A and she has always sworn that she never knew about his philandering, that she always assumed his prolonged absences had more to do with his job. So... <clears throat> if I may speak. You may speak all you want. We will never truly know what people think in their head. And what people think in their head is not the same as it comes out sometimes. That's, you know what I'm saying? Lies have been around since humans came to life. Sure. Since people found out that they could fly. Actually, I have a theory. I have a theory. Is this like when you told me that I shouldn't do her because then she expected? No, no, it's nothing like that. Here's my theory. What? Yes, that's his theory on babies, that the only reason we have to feed babies is because we start feeding in them and then they expect it. They would be perfectly fine if we never fed babies at all. But once you feed them once, then they expect it. And if you don't feed them after that, then, there will, then they'll die. I'm glad it's just me being silly. But <laughs> this theory that I have. <laughs> I told them that theory doesn't work because the umbilical cord automatically starts feeding them before they came out. So there's no way to actually plant that off and not feed them. Anyway, so they your theory... Right. So here's my theory, okay? We know that, that Sharon Kinney was tried in Kansas City and she was acquitted. Oh, bringing this up. Look at our kid. And she was acquitted. She's getting so mad and then, now. And then she stole a time machine. She went back in time, had a relationship with Judge Joseph Crater, and then she killed him. He is trying to make you crazy. That's my theory. He's trying to get you riled up. You hear this crazy? See, our episode 19 is in, is 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 na, 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 mama. our episode 19 is attacking our episode 156 yes <laughs> okay stop, stop, stop. that was my theory that's that's quite a theory that was your something well either way my my point remains the same the man had no shortage of people who wanted to take him out. So, I mean, assuming he was dead was probably the white thing, right thing the wife did. And that's my point. Let's open this court case, I guess. Um, I'm going to say this right now. The man deserves what he got. If he's dead, if he died, he died. If he didn't, go for him, I guess. Uh, you know what I say? Karma is a real pain in the butt. I'm yeah, not going to say the actual word. Because, yeah, we don't pass your own podcast. That's, that's true. Um, he was just a real female dog. I, I hate people who cheat. I hate people who do anything like that. I just cannot stand it. Um, sure, people have their own reasons for doing things, but some reasons are stupid. This was stupid. 
Uh, and that's pretty much all I have to say. The man must have been very smart, but maybe not so smart. Maybe not smart enough to see what was captured on his tail. Because if he did die, by the way, that I thought he died, he had it coming. He's the one who continued with infidelity his whole life. So, that's on him. And I guess my final thought is this. The, the last day of his life, we know he tore up documents, because I don't think they had actual shredders back in the day. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think they had actual shredders in the early 1930s. Um, but we know that he spent his day tearing up documents. After that, he had all this money withdrawn, $90,000 in today's terms. And he took these to his New York apartment. Right. Which makes me wonder if either he wasn't paying someone off who had dirt on him, or, or if he wasn't trying to stock up a nest egg so he could get away from something bad that was coming. Yeah. But if he disappeared... You'd think it would come up. You know, you'd think sooner or later somebody would go, hey, aren't you Joseph Crater? Uh, on top of which, see, I tend to think that maybe he was trying to buy his way out of a scandal. And, and to me, then, that goes to Vivian Gordon. I think that if she had managed to survive we would know a lot more about uh, about the judge's disappearance than we do. And I also think it's really convenient that June Bryce went into a mental ward. But as to what actually happened to him, I have no idea. I just, I can't. There's just not enough information. So, anybody have anything else they want to add? That brings us to the end of our show. It does. Uh, as always, thanks for listening. Did you enjoy the show? Do you have your own thoughts on the case? Do you have an idea for a show topic we could cover? A great place to tell us about any or all of this is our Facebook group. Uh, a great and chill place to hang out. We uh, also, of course, need to uh, thank not only our listeners, but Bill Barrent, who does our theme music. Uh, that last name is spelled B-E-H-R-E-N-D-T. Uh, you can, uh, if you need music for a project, Bill's your guy. If you need to hire a, a musician for an event, Bill's also your guy. Uh, if you need a podcast uh, hosted by two musicians, the Rusty and Dusty podcast, it, Bill is still your guy. And you can reach him at Bill Barrent, B-E-H-R-E-N-D-T, once again, at sbcglobal.net. Also, I uh, need to say thanks to Paige Elmore of Reverie True Crime. If you're looking for a true crime podcast, Paige has got a heck of a show for you. But in addition to being a true crime queen, she is also a Canva addict, something she has combined with our own Krista's artwork to do our logo art. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Paige. Thanks also to go to Aaron Gnurk of the Big Dumb Fun Show, who continues to promote us locally. Uh, what are we doing next week? Maybe Hollywood's Haunted Roosevelt Hotel, Haunted by Celebrities Past, maybe something else. We don't know. We'll see. Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.